Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, today we are going to cover um, part one of two for the gases. Gases can be quite complex, and it is unfortunately something that lands at the end of the semester. So it is something that you're definitely going to want to make sure that you are um, paying attention to and that you definitely review. Okay, so let's go ahead without further ado and get started. Throughout much of human history, airs or gases were not believed to be matter at all. Their apparently weightless nature and their ability to move about freely and fill all available space while carrying with them definite physical properties such as odor and sometimes color conferred upon them somewhat mysterious nature. Even the scientist Robert Boyle, pictured here, wrote about the strange subtlety, great efficacy, and determinate nature of effluviums is what he called it. It's interesting, however, that around 550 before the Common Era, the Greek philosopher Anaximenes maintained that all matter consisted of air. It is from air that all things that exist, have existed, or will exist, come into being. The invention of the sensitive balance in the early 17th century showed once and for all that gases have weight and therefore matter. Guericke's invention of the air pump, which led directly to his discover, discovery of a vacuum, launched the pneumatic era of chemistry, long before the existence of atoms and molecules had been accepted. Indeed, the behavior of gases was soon to prove an invaluable tool in the development of the atomic theory of matter. The study of gases allows us to understand the behavior of matter at its simplest. Individual particles acting independently, almost completely uncomplicated, by interactions and interferences between each other. Later on, our knowledge of gases will serve as the pathway for our understanding on far more complicated condensed phases, such as liquids and solids, in which the theory of gases will no longer give us correct answers, but it will still provide us with a useful model that will help us rationalize the behavior of these more complicated states of matter. So first of all, we know that gas has no definite volume or shape. A gas will fill whatever volume is available to it. Contrast this to the behavior of a liquid, which always has a distinct upper surface when its volume is less than that of the space it occupies. The other outstanding characteristic of gases is their low densities, compared with those of other liquids and solids. One mole of liquid water at 298 Kelvin and one atmosphere of pressure occupies a volume of 18.8 .8 centimeters cubed whereas the same quantity of water vapor at the same temperature and pressure has a volume of 30,200 cubic centimeters, more than a thousand times greater. The most remarkable property of gases, however, is that to a very good approximation, they all behave the same way in response to changes in temperature and pressure, expanding or contracting by predictable amounts. This is, a very, this is very different from the behavior of liquids or solids, those condensed phases in which the properties of each particular substance must be determined individually. We will see later that each of these three macroscopic characteristics of gases follows directly from the microscopic view, that is, from the atomic nature of the matter. The molecules of a gas being in continuous motion frequently strike the inner walls of their container. As they do so, they immediately bounce off without loss of kinetic energy but with reversal of direction, in other words, acceleration, imparts a force to the container walls. This force, divided by the total surface area on which it acts, is the pressure of a gas. The pressure of a gas is observed by measuring the pressure that must be applied externally in order to keep the gas from expanding or contracting. To visualize this, imagine some gas trapped in a cylinder having one end enclosed by a freely moving piston. In order to keep the gas in the container, a certain amount of weight, more precisely a force, must be placed on the piston so as to exactly balance the force exerted by the gas on the bottom of the piston, and tending to push it up. The pressure of the gas is simply the quotient of force divided by the area, because area is the cross-sectional area of this piston. The unit of pressure in the SI system is called the Pascal which is defined as the force of one newton per square meter. At Earth's surface, the force of gravity acting on a one kilogram mass is 9.81 newtons. Thus, 
if we take a look here, the weight is one kilogram and the surface area of the piston would be one meter um, squared, then the pressure of the gas would be 9.8 pascals. A one gram weight acting on the piston of one centimeter uh, squared cross section would exert a pressure of 98.1 uh, pascals. If you wonder why the pressure is higher in the second example, consider the number of cubic centimeters contained in one uh, or one square centimeter div divided by the meter squared. In chemistry, it's more common to express pressures in units of atmospheres or torr. One atmosphere is 101,325 pascals or 760 torr. The older unit, millimeters of mercury, is almost the same as the torr. It's defined as one millimeter of level difference in a mercury barometer at zero degrees Celsius. In meteorology, the pressure unit is most commonly used as a bar. One bar is the same as 750.06 torr or 0.987 atmospheres. The pressure of gases encountered in nature span an exceptionally wide range, only part of which ordinarily encountered in chemistry. Note that in the chart, you see that the pressure scales are logarithmic, so zero on the atmospheric scale means 10 to the zero or one atmosphere. Okay, so we're going to convert these uh, pressures. I want you to remember that one atmosphere is the same as 760 millimeters of mercury, and that is the same as 101.3 kilopascals. So when we are converting 743 millimeters of mercury to atmospheres, we divide that by 760 millimeters of mercury per atmosphere, and that gives us 0.98 atmospheres. Similarly, 895 kilopascals divided by 101.3 kilopascals times 760 millimeters of mercury gives us 6,715 millimeters of mercury. The column of air above us exerts a for force on each one square centimeter of surface equivalent to a weight of about 1,034 grams. The higher into the air you go, the smaller the mass of air above you and the lower the pressure. So if several kilos of air are constantly pressing down on your body, why don't you feel it? Well, the answer is because every other part of your body, including with the air within your lungs and insides, also experiences the same pressure. So there's no net force other than gravity acting on you, so you don't feel it. This was the crucial first step that led eventually to the concept of gases and their essential role in the early development of chemistry. In the early 17th century, the Italian Evangelista Torricelli invented a device called the barometer to measure the pressure of the atmosphere. A few later, years later, the German scientist and sometime mayor of Magdeburg, Otto von Guericke, devised a method of pumping the air out of a container and created what might be considered the opposite of air, the vacuum. As with so many advances in science, ideas of a vacuum, a region of nothingness, was not immediately accepted. Torricelli's invention overturned the then common belief that air, and by extension all gases, were weightless. The fact that we live at the bottom of a sea of air was most spectacularly demonstrated in 1654, when two teams of eight horses were unable to pull apart two 14-inch copper hemispheres, the Magdeburg hemispheres, which had been joined together and then evacuated with Guericke's new, newly invented vacuum pump. The classical barometer, still used for the most accurate work, measures the height of a column of liquid that can be supported by the atmosphere. This pressure is exerted directly on the liquid in the reservoir and is transmitted hydrostatically to the liquid in the column. Metallic mercury, being a liquid of exceptionally high density and low vapor pressure, is the ideal barometric fluid. Its widespread use gave rise to the millimeter of mercury term, which is now re usually referred to as the TOR, as a measure of pressure. The density of water, however, is only 1 over 13.6, that of mercury. So standard atmospheric pressure would support a water column whose height is 13.6 times 76 centimeters, 
which is 1,034 centimeters or 10.3 meters. You would have to read a water barometer from a four-story window in order to use water for this. Barometers can take many forms, however. The aneroid barometers employ a sealed bellows which moves a pointer. In this one, when the children retreat into the inside and the old lady emerges, the weather indicates inclement weather. And small water barometers, such as this one, register only variations in the pressure because the swan's body is open to the air. It doesn't actually give you an actual measurement, however. Okay, we will pick this up in part two.